we're, we're quite excited to talk about housing affordability. We think our, our timing is impeccable because this, uh, I think, has become one of, if not the uh, most pressing issues facing the city of Vancouver. Um, I'm sure most people in the, in the room uh, would like to see the, the federal and provincial governments come back to the, the table in, in developing affordable housing in a more meaningful way. Um, and we've essentially taken as our starting point the fact that the feds in the province have not really done uh, much there. That's not to let them off the hook. We think they are very much part of the solution. But we're trying to focus today on medium to long term solutions in affordable housing and looking at that through the lens uh, of urban planning, through good design, through incentives, uh, through working um, with the private sector and market forces to both uh, increase the total supply of housing but also how we can lock in affordability as we, we move forward. So that's essentially what we mean when we say affordability by design, how we can get to some notions of market rate affordability, how we can eliminate barriers to the design solutions that we talk about. Before people could have a program, they, they had to have some kind of a philosophical base, and, and that's what Hayek and, and Friedman and, and the others uh, created there. And, and they, were, they set out to discredit the institutions that uh, you know, had, had been built. Uh, establish and fund a network of research groups and think tanks to promote neoliberal ideology and apply it to current industries, or, sorry, current issues. And establish institutions to support and sustain that ideology. <laughs> Public-private partnerships. You know, when you think about what's going on uh, in this province, there's a whole agency of government that's been set up to encourage these, these kinds of, of, of uh, partnerships. And the reason for that is you get a big change in, in, in people's ideas once the, the, the uh, pr private is, is in it. I mean, the, the rationale is supposed to be that the, the, uh, uh, the, what the private company brings to it will, will be both more efficiency, because all government uh, is inefficient, you know, according to, to, to that view, uh, but, but also that they'll, they'll handle the risks that, that they're involved in. Of course, if you look at the history of what happens in public-private partnerships, it's just the opposite. In fact, if there's a problem, the, the government's always brought in to, to bail them out. When I think of the term, the conversation, um, I always think of Larry Beasley, because he's famous for acknowledging the need for the conversation that needs to happen. So I don't think Larry Beasley's the type of person who needs much of an introduction. Uh, I will tell you one thing I learned by reading his bio is that he is a member of the Order of Canada. Uh, and we're also uh, particularly pleased because uh, this is one of his first public speaking engagements uh, unplugged from the civic bureaucracy. So Larry, the floor is yours. <laughs> This is my first few days uh, as a private citizen, having turned over the reins to Brent Totterian, and I'm, I'm nonetheless happy to participate in this housing forum because this issue, in my opinion, is one of the things that matters to me most. It goes beyond being a director of planning. It goes to being a, a citizen uh, of Vancouver. Um, I dare say that housing affordability is emerging as the single most worrisome immediate issue in Vancouver. Everyone seems to be talking about it, especially over the last year, or year and a half. And I think that is because we have seen dramatic rises in housing prices. Now, as a footnote, one can only imagine what the prices of housing would be today if we had not built those thousands of housing units in the downtown and elsewhere over the last decade. You know, we worry about the price of housing, I worry about it every moment, but if we had not built that housing, we would really be in bad shape. We refuse to remain silent! Who here refuses to remain silent? <laughs> And we're now seeing this in Vancouver. All you have to do is go over to the train convention center on any evening and look underneath 
and you'll see a community of people living in complete illegality. And that's all they have. And we must do everything we can to avoid all this. We don't know yet about what's going to happen in Woodridge. We do know that there will be co-op housing in it. The rest of it, we're working with people day and night to find out what their ideas are and what we can bring to the table to make this truly the greatest redevelopment that Canada has seen in the urban area. Strictly and symbolically, the Woodwards building is pivotal to the downtown east side. And in fact, this building does not belong to one person or to one group of people, but to rather all of the city and all of the community, and we have to recognize that. The landmark sign that we see up there has sat on that building since 1958. Um, and it has served as a beacon for the people of Vancouver and the downtown core for all of that time. So, as a frame for our work today, I commend us to start with two simple guiding principles. They're hard to achieve, but I think they're the right aspiration for all the work that we do. First, there has to be a place to live for every citizen. No one can be allowed to fall through the cracks. Not even one homeless person is acceptable in our city. And second, there has to be housing for all kinds of people of all economic strata in every community, in Vancouver and in the greater Vancouver region. Now, so far, alas, we've not been able to sustain those principles. I'm sorry about that. Now, when it comes to low-income affordability, I want to not let us get off the hook uh, uh, to what I believe is the, the simple and most real premise about this topic. And it's a premise that has been denied in this country for well over a decade. And that is that low-income people cannot compete for the, in the housing market. They cannot compete without some form of government support, either to them directly or to the housing they occupy. But to balance budgets, government, have too, government has too long ignored this fact and the affordability problems that we see throughout our country and the spin-off social problems that we see throughout our country, in my opinion, is an inevitable result of that. So there are, in my opinion, two at least beginnings of solutions for that. And the first, and it's not rocket science, and I think it must be repeated in every single forum like this before we get into everything else, and that is that governments at all levels, and especially the federal government, with all of its surpluses and all of its raise, ways to raise money, has to put more money into social housing, or it has to give more money to poor people so that they can secure housing. And to me, one of the changes that we have to make from the past is to secure a dependable source for these funds. So social housing funding doesn't really depend, uh, depend upon the whims of a particular government or a particular budget from year to year. You know, we talk about the gasoline tax being dedicated to transit. Why not the property transfer tax or in similar taxes being dedicated to low-income housing? We need, my point is, we need a sustained source of public funding for the insatiable demand of low-income housing. Probably forever, 20% of our citizens will not be able to compete, and we have to do something collectively about that in the way that we allocate resources.